Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this year's BSR ICS joint lecture. We do this every year and um, it's a particular pleasure because it, the BSR lets us know, the British Scotland Road lets us know who are the hot lecturers um, and we have exciting projects to talk about so we often get ahead of the pack of this. Um, this is a very happy relationship we have with the British School at Rome. Many members of the, here have gone back and forth between London or the UK and Rome many times and we hope to carry this on. It's a great pleasure to welcome and thank the British School at Rome, uh, Dr. Christina Bieja, who is here today. Yeah. Uh, Christina has um, a PhD from La Sapienza and um, has postdocs from Heidelberg and um, Rome, Berlin, um, London, and is back now in La Sapienza, and, and in act of sort of supererogation, is now doing a second PhD <laughs> in Southampton, um, which which is normally reserved only as a terrible punishment. <laughs> so, but we're really, really, really pleased to have you back in London to talk to us today about thinking about the management of the Etruscan cities. Welcome. First of all, I would like to thank you for the very kind words and uh, it's a honor to be here this evening. Uh, I'm here this evening to, to speak of the management of Etruscan cities, or maybe better, of what I think of the management of Etruscan cities. So, um, I would begin, if I may, with a kind of uh, autobiographical quotation. When I was about 16 or 17 years old, as most of the teenagers of my generation, I got engaged in the reading of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Well, uh, at least I tried, uh, because I must admit that I always had difficulty in understanding the spatial organization of Tolkien's Middle Earth. Uh, it seemed to me, but I fully acknowledge that it is my limit, my fault, complete fault. Uh, it seemed to me extremely complex and at the same time foggy. Uh, working on Etruscan urbanism sometimes still gives me the feeling I'm moving in a kind of Middle Earth, uh, <laughs> where certainties are few, the data one bumps into are often old, unclear and fuzzy, and the conclusions are sometimes divergent or, if not, absent. Uh, I have been first tiptoeing uh, and then walking in this ancient Middle Earth for the last 10 years. And what I would like to try here this evening is to present the stage of art of my thinking. And in the end, this is a kind of excusatio non petita. I still have no certainties, therefore do not expect certainties from me this evening. Uh, I would like at the same time to present the future perspectives of, my, of this research path I'm following. Uh, a research path that has been conducted at and in different ways, uh, fully supported by three different institutions, the British School at Rome, the University of Southampton, and now the Sapienza Università di Roma. Uh, to all these institutions, I express uh, my deepest gratitude. Uh, as known in Etruria, as known in Etruria, a complex network of cities controlled large and variously articulated territories. This structure can be fully perceived from at least the 7th century BC and is the outcome of a very long phase of urbanization which began in the late Bronze Age at the latest. The urban form in the Tyrrhenian context must therefore be read as the result of a long and complex process. The extremely significant role played by several Etruscan cities in the Mediterranean in the first millennium BC is well known. Uh, just to recall here, a few data, beginning with the relevance of the international hub of Cere between the 8th and the 5th century BC, evidenced also by the Tesauros, the Siltivit at the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Delphi, and continuing with the crucial involvement of Tarquini and they in the history of archaic Rome, and with the management of the often difficult political and commercial relations with the Punic Ward and Greek colonies of the northern sector of the Tyrrhenian Sea, in which the city of Volci played an extremely relevant role. Considering these premises, the necessity to fully understand the trust and urban phenomenon in its Mediterranean setting is not only desirable, but also, I would say, a necessity. The situation we are at the moment facing is rather unbalanced. As known over the past 50 years, extensive and in-depth investigations have focused on both Greek and Roman urban realities. 
examining all of their possible articulations and rendering them somewhat paradigmatic of other urban experiences that developed in the Mediterranean area in a similar time span. This is the case, for instance, of the Etruscan area, where, depending on the period, either the Greek or the Roman realities have often been used to explain the local urban phenomenon, thus transforming the Etruscan cities into a kind of pale imitation of external experiences and consequently diminishing the emic contribution to local urbanism. Here and there, few voices stepped out of the core. It is the case, for instance, of Bruno D'Agostino, who proposed in a well-known paper to speak of a known polis of Etruscans, but he remained, with few exceptions, an isolated voice. However, the choice of a specific urban form is strongly connected with society that produces it. I want to be clear, if it is and it is surely desirable that a comparative approach on a Mediterranean scale be undertaken. However, such an endeavor would only be possible having gain, gained a more thorough understanding of the different urban phenomena in the region. And in the case of Etruria, this type of knowledge is still in an embryonic state. The deep roots of a slippery situation must lie in the ways in which archaeological investigations has developed in central Italy in the last two centuries. I think I'm telling nothing new if I say that the study of Etruscan cities had been substantially neglected until the last 40 years. Indeed, the absence of thorough studies on the so-called cities of the living uh, interestingly and meaningfully opposed both in the literature and in the practice to the cities of the dead is widely acknowledged as one of the weaknesses of Etruscan studies and more in general of archaeology and history of pre-Roman Italy. This situation can be indirectly observed as early as the 19th centuries, sorry, century in two monumental works on the Etruscans based on the accurate observation and description of the ancient remains. I am referring in particular to Luigi Canina's L'Antica Etruria Maritima, compresa nella edizione pontificia, and George Dennis' Cities and Cemeteries of Etruria. Even more than a century after these works, were published and only 20 years ago, the situations, maybe a bit more, the situation remained larger and changed. In a moment in which the scientific debate on Etruscan cities was particularly intense, I would say even more intense than nowadays, on a wide international setting, Graham Barkham and Tom Rasmussen wrote, our understanding of Etruscan settlements is still far less comprehensive than we could wish. Until a generation ago, most discussions of Etruscan settlements largely had to have recourse to two sets of indirect evidence, the comments made by later Greek and Roman writers and the inferences that could be drawn from the location, architecture and contents of Etruscan tombs. Well, this statement records only one side of the coin. And to summarize briefly but effectively, I think, what happened in the last century in the investigation of Etruscan cities, it is clear that a twofold approach substantially characterized the prickly debate. These divergent approaches were a positivistic and analytical one, adopted predominantly, but not exclusively, by the Italian tradition of studies, and a more theoretical and more recent one, typical, but once again not exclusive, of what we could in general terms define as international scholarship. Only in the last 20 years, the two approaches, which had previously followed substantially parallel routes, have begun to communicate effectively. In the first line of the research, it is necessary to remember that after the major excavations of Etruscan necropolis carried out mainly after the unification of Italy and throughout the first half of the 20th century, mostly with a positivistic approach, the second half of the last century saw for the first time the intense exploration of some crucial religious contexts and then, only from the beginning of the 1980s, the development of projects investigating large areas of some especially South Etruscan cities. I am referring in particular to the well-known cases of Tarquini, Cere, and Vey projects. Obviously, I'm speaking of excavations. The topographical tradition is something completely different. The situation was and is completely different in the so-called Etruria of the Po Valley, where, for instance, Marzabotto, intensely investigated since the mid of the 19th century, and Felsina, although excavated to a lesser extent, have created a solid base for the understanding of Etruscan urban settlements in, I will use a word that I personally do not like, and therefore I will use it in inverted commas, colonial areas. But we cannot think of explaining the urban phenomenon in Etruria looking at uh, the North Etruria. It's another thing. 
The stunning increase of data regarding the trusts and settlements has surely been the main outcome of these investigations. However, notwithstanding all the new information now available, in the last 30 years of scholarly interest has been focused primarily on the origins of the trusts and settlements, rather than on the attempt to reconstruct and understand their development through the centuries, until at least the Roman conquest of the region. In other words, scholars have drawn their attention not to the concept of urbanism, with all its social, political, economic, and lato sensu cultural implications, but rather to the controversial issue of the urbanization of Eruria. The main outcome is therefore that an in-depth and satisfactory picture of the ways in which the Roman form developed between roughly the second half of the eighth and the Roman conquest can be sketched for none of those cities. In all those cases, it is often possible to describe, and this has often been done, the development of specific monuments, or of particular, often narrow, sectors of a settlement, but almost no attempt has been made to follow the wider urban development. However, something is moving in that direction with a series of researches that adopt a topographical descriptive approach. And I'm speaking of Marcello Waitley's recent attempt for Vey, Bocobelli's attempt for Vulci, uh, and the still uh, unpublished but announced uh, uh, attempt of the equipe of the University of Milan uh, on, uh, on Tarquinia. However, if the, adoption, if the adoption of a descriptive approach can be considered surely useful, I think we should and could move a step forward in the understanding of the urban phenomenon in Etruria. In other words, the urban form can, should be considered the direct outcome of the incessant work of the local elites and political authorities to shape, reshape and carefully manage their settlements. And this is a concept that obviously is not limited to the Etruscan environment. In other words, Etruscan urbanism must be considered a direct outcome of a social political choice. It did not happen. Rather, someone consciously made it happen. A social political choice of which, and this is maybe the real tricky point, it is currently possible to perceive almost exclusively <coughs> through the material remains. As a matter of fact, the material aspect in all its facets is the only direct source we can rely on. As ancient written sources produced by, let me say, the enemies and or the victors, must be inevitably <coughs> considered in direct sources for most of pre-Roman Italy, including the Romans. Uh, sorry, including the Etruscans. They are direct for the Romans, not for us. They were written in different cultural systems. This does not mean that we do not have to consider them, but that, on the contrary, they must be seriously but critically used, always bearing in mind the seminal methodological caveat expressed in different moments and circumstances by Massimo Pallottino, Emilio Gamba, and Tim Cornell. Considering these premises, it is necessary to develop a way to read, understand, and interpret the materiality of the trust and urban phenomenon, so that in a second moment it will be possible to approach the immaterial level indirectly shedding light also on the society that expressed the specific urban choice. So I personally believe that a good approach is to proceed from the general to the particular. This means to tackle in premise the <coughs> wider issue, recognizing what are the relevant aspects in an Etruscan city, the ones that give us the opportunity to follow urban development through the centuries. In other words, it is first of all necessary to detect the most relevant pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, the ones that, if we want to continue using this metaphor, allow us to define the perimeter of a picture we would like to recreate. In order to reach such a goal, I believe that the first step is to define the physical spaces of the city through the adoption of a multi-scale approach. It is first of all necessary to understand and investigate the macroscale. It has the difference, the different intertwined physical spaces and functional areas that compose an Etruscan city, bearing in mind that the urban phenomenon, also in Etruria, must always be read from a long durée perspective, appreciating the, its intrinsic dynamism. And even if this could seem self-evident observation, I had the idea that we sometimes tend to forget them, using archaeological partitions or historical dates as easy solutions for our problems. Uh, while the reality is generally everything but linear and easy. From this perspective, it is, uh, it is well known that the most significant southern Etruscan cities seem to share similar structural features, due in large part also to the relatively common geographical environment. A first comparative analysis of a macro scale level seems to suggest a shared structure, an urban center, 
physically divided <coughs> from, but at the same time strictly intertwined with the primary suburban area, in which a system of infrastructures, sanctuaries and or shrines is located, and by a second wider ring composed of a necropolis, in which the ancestors, conveniently managed by the ruling authority, are placed in order to enclose the city of the living in a kind of sacred belt. This macrostructure can be clearly perceived in most cases in a still not completely organized form from the 7th century BC and lasts with constant and gradual reshaping until the very end of the Etruscan urban phenomenon, following the Roman conquest of the region and the gradual transformation of its inhabitants into, into Romans. I would say that the first outcome of the recognition of this structure is the almost obvious observation that there is no need to maintain a divide between the city of the living and the city of the dead, being the second one managed by the first one. If the macrostructure is relatively clear, albeit still to be fully understood in specific cases, the more we move towards the microscale, the more the picture becomes blurred and unclear. As far as I know, there are few, if not, if not almost no cases, in which even a mere satisfactory <coughs> comprehensive descriptive approach can be adopted. I am not referring to a general one. City walls are here, temples are there, roads are here and there. I'm speaking of a detailed one. In order, on the one hand, to test the theoretical approach described thus far, I have been working over the last 10 years on a pilot study case, the small, I know it is small, but extremely relevant, pre-Roman city of Faleri in the middle Tiber Valley. As far as the macro scale is concerned, for Faleri's ground no doubts, in terms of topography, the ancient settlement rose on two hills, the so-called Vignale, the small one, and the Civita Castellana Hill, in red in the slide. The former is still inhabited, while the latter is nowadays largely occupied by the medieval and modern town of Civita Castellana. The total extension of the ancient city center was about 44 hectares. However, in this dimensional calculation, a wide suburban area clearly directly under the control of the city must be added. In fact, a complex religious system composed of at least three suburban sanctuaries and the necropolis positioned on the hilltops of the Tufa Plateau surrounding the urban area can be found in this picture. <coughs> so my idea was especially to try to see if the detailed knowledge of a micro scale could bring a substantial contribution to our understanding of trust and urbanism, or if, on the contrary, it added only a great amount of details, maybe too many, with the consequent impossibility to sketch a coherent picture, considering always that we are dealing with extremely fragmented pictures. Well, uh, it did not work in that way. Details were and are an incredible amount. But if well organized, they give also the opportunity to read the city from a holistic point of view. Uh, let's return to Faleri. I perfectly knew that there were some problems, some methodological problems concerning the choice of a case study. I spoke of a pre-Roman city, not an Etruscan city. The question could be, why Faleri and not another bigger and to some extent more Etruscan city? Basically for two reasons. The first one is that Faleri can be considered a privileged observation point of the Tyrrhenian urban phenomenon because of the intense investigations of the last 150 years remained up to now substantially unpublished or partially published or published in a sectorial way. The second one has to do with the fact that it has the right dimension, a dimension that can be, in a sense, controlled by a single scholar, and therefore it is a perfect pilot study case. I could control the data coming from the detail of 44 hectares plus this verbium with difficulty, but I can. I could not have controlled, for instance, the 190 hectares plus the suburbium, for instance, of they all by myself for a for sample case. It would have been impossible. And as far as the possible objection, is not Faleri Faliscan and therefore a non etruscan city? I think that the answer must be searched and found in the analysis of a material record. The urban form at Faleri is clearly recognizable from the archaic period onwards not before, and we will return on this. Uh, maybe there's in Nuce, but it's not recognizable, it's not fully recognizable before. This declares the particular cultural vicinity of the Faliscan environment to a Etruscan world, and its progressive and growing distance from the Lato sensu Italic milieu, 
where, as known, the urban experience is everything but the rule. This affinity of Faleri to the Etruscan area of the Italian peninsula becomes clearer and stronger from the recent phase of a so-called orientalizing period using uh, um, an archaeological uh, chronology, that is, last quarter of the seventh, first quarter of the sixth century BC, and continues then in the archaic period, sixth and fifth century. The cultural affinity between Faleri and the Etruscan cities, Cher in particular, is visible, for instance, in the 7th century BC by the adoption on the necropolis of some specific types of chamber tombs or by the local craft productions, which indirectly testify the commercial and cultural connections existing between the Etruscans and the Faliscans realities. In the 7th century BC is the moment, if the 7th century BC is the moment in which the phenomenon can be perceived, perhaps still in Nutra, from the archaic period onwards, the affinity with the Etruscan cities becomes extremely evident in many ways. Just to quote a single but meaningful example, the practice of putting rich grave goods in archaic tombs is clearly in opposition to what happens in the Latin area. Should not the Faliscans look in that direction instead? Well, this custom is perhaps the most evident and easily perceivable aspect of this ongoing cultural osmosis between the Faliscan and the Etruscan world. I want to be clear. It does not have to do with ethnicity or things like that. It, it is a cultural choice. Maybe there's also an economic reason, but it's a cultural choice. Furthermore, from the later archaic period, also the ancient literary sources speak of these cultural and political similarities. From the first decades of the 5th century BC, Livy recalls on many occasions the role of faithful allies played by the Faliscans towards the Etruscans against the Roman expansion in central Italy. And in this picture, the fact that the Faliscans and their main city Faleri were repeatedly admitted to the Fanum Voltumne, the federal Etruscan sanctuary where the Concilia Etruria were organized, is a particularly relevant detail. The major commercial, this is what we perceive through material record, political, maybe, role played by Faleri in the Tiber Valley after the Roman conquest of Vey must also be read as a consequence of this close alliance with the Etruscan cities. So, Faleri was therefore, at least in my opinion, a good study case. But uh, what has uh, the passage from the macro scale to the micro scale exactly implied in the Faleri case? How was it possible? So I will begin from this second question, because what is generally said is that the passage between the two levels in the Etruscan cities is not possible because of the lack of excavations in the urban centers. In the Faliscan case, um, but I would argue also in our cases, the crucial issue is the possibility to analyze all the unpublished old and sometimes less old data, which are mostly stored in Italian archives and are still unpublished. This means, in other words, that it is necessary to recognize that we are potentially standing on the shoulders of underestimated giants. In the, in the Faleri case, then that analysis has allowed to explore crucial changes in the use and organization of the spaces, the ways in which the political power managed them, the ways in which we can perceive the change in relations between the categories of the public and the private in the, in the city throughout the centuries. Now, uh, unless thinking of staying here for the next uh, two weeks, uh, uh, but I'm afraid that this could be considered kidnapping. Uh, I will try to explain the potentiality of the method through some specific examples. Uh, in detail, I will choose two specific moments related to specific issues. The first one is the management of a private spaces in the second half of the seventh, beginning of the sixth century BC. The second one is the management of organization of the public spaces of the city between the end of the 6th and beginning of the 5th century BC. This means in the end that I will try to sketch the ways in which Faleri was managed in two centuries between, let's say, 7th and 5th BC. Dealing with the first issue means inevitably to deal with the first perception of the city. So Faleri provides an extremely rich but unbalanced set of data 
for the period between the late 8th and the 6th century BC. A particularly rich funerary record corresponds to a relatively few data from the inhabited area. I will not return here on the debated <coughs> existence, non-existence of an Iron Age phase at Faleri, and of the existence, non-existence of a Montarano settlement uh, that is rough. Do you see that they are rough here? Yes. Uh, that is rough. Should be here. We are not sure about the, the position. Uh, I will directly begin from the 7th century BC when the situation is clearer. And it's this one uh, with the inhabited area in red and in blue, the necropolis. Only from the first decades of the 7th century BC onwards does a change seem to be clearly perceivable. Once again, the necropolis are the litmus test in connection both to their partially changed position and to their different internal organization. So I said that I wouldn't have spoken, but before the necropolis are one here and the other, a small one here in the city center. And for the Bronze Age, we have something here. Uh, as you can see, the position is completely changed in the seventh. Um, it is perhaps not the case that the Montarano necropolis that should be here, contains no burials after the first decades of the 7th century BC, and we have no more data from the extremely poor, poorly known necropolis in the Scazato area. This one. It seems, in other words, that these two necropolis were abandoned in that period. And this is the only thing I will say today about them. Yet, this is the period in which it is possible to perceive a new and meaningful organization in the funerary record. A kind of ring around the two hills of Civita Castellana and Vignale can be detected. This ring is composed of a penna necropolis to the west, that of the Cappuccini, Colonnette to the north, and the necropolis of Celle to the east, plus Monte Paglietta here in the south. This ring will remain an urban characteristic through the centuries and it will represent at the same time a clear demarcation of the close suburbium of the city. And in this perspective of the development of this enclosed urban structure, the observation that the entrances of the most relevant chamber tombs of the 7th century BC in all the above mentioned necropolis share the same orientation, facing the two plateaus of Civita Castellana and Vignale, becomes particularly meaningful. In other words, the will to recognize the importance of the two hills seems clear and it is highly possible, if not certain, that in this period the settlement already occupied the two plateaux, or perhaps more accurately, it was developing on them. Moreover, the possibility of recognizing strong differences among the burials of a single necropolis is a further step towards understanding the several components that resulted in the formation of the city of Faleri at this chronological moment. The Celle and Monte Paglietta necropolis, this is an example from Celle and this is an, an example from Monte Paglietta, uh, appear surely as the most open to Etruscan and in particular Seretan influence, as clearly visible, for instance, in the adoption of complex, sometimes painted funerary architecture. Then the Pen necropolis seems to follow a more conservative pattern. Trench tombs here survive for a longer period. A single tomb discovered in the Cappuccini necropolis clearly demonstrates Italic connections operating in the Falisca metropolis at this chronological point. I would define it as a cultural melting pot, um, characterized by Italic and Etruscan <coughs> components. And it seems to me uh, that this is the most accurate way to read the evidence. Moving to the inhabited area on the Vignale Hill, no structure, yeah, this is a Vignale one, no structure has yet been dated to the late 8th, 6th century BC. Although a good quantity of pots, of pots sheds that can be dated in that period have been collected, both during the survey undertaken, to, undertaken at the beginning of the 1980s and in the most recent survey that took place at the very beginning of this century. And uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the, there's a huge concentration of, uh, for this chronology in a specific area of the plateau. Uh, the situation is different uh, as far as the Civita Castellana Hill is concerned. <coughs> Obviously, here we can investigate uh, the areas in which 
was a was not a modern city. Uh, from the seventh century onwards, as we have already said, no funerary context is documented with the exception of five or possibly six infant burials in the Scasato area. The Scasato area is this area. And they are like this, the eyes of the grave goods found in them, a miniaturized bucero and a Trisco Corinthian pottery, uh, suggests a chronology of the burials I just put some examples here, taking place between the second half of the seventh and the first two decades of the sixth century BC. But these tombs must be considered part of the inhabited area and connected to the well-known use, at least in the Latin area, to bury infants close to houses. This sector of the plateau underwent wide and complex transformations in the following centuries and therefore no traces of the domestic structures connected to those burials were found during the excavations. However, in these two areas, this and this, uh, in this case they, uh, we are analyzing materials coming from uh, excavations um, led by superintendents, so we are still unpublished but uh, uh, we are working on them. Um, so, how, however, the recovered architectural materials uh, are the indirect proof of the existence in the area of houses built in stonework with roofs with terracotta decorations that find good comparison also as far as measures are concerned, for instance, with the contemporary roof decorations at Aqua Rossa. Uh, the ties and the rich ties share exactly the same dimensions of the one known in Aqua Rossa. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, uh, I put this, the tomb and località Capuccini, because we tend to, we have this use of closing the loculi uh, in the tombs uh, with, uh, with ties. And uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the ties used in the necropolis and the tile used in the inhabited areas are the same, or the same dimensions, uh, obviously in the same chronological phase. The infant burials are distributed across a rather wide area and this can be read as a proof that at least a consistent portion of the east sector of the Civita Castellana Plateau hosted a residential quarter, or maybe better, was articulated in more nuclei. To sum up, for the period comprised of, of the last decades of the 8th to the 6th uh, century BC, it is possible to distinguish two different moments. Firstly, a point at which the settlement is still organized in a still relatively unknown number of inhabited areas to which specific necropolis can be attributed. A secondly, a period, which is the one which is so now, possibly beginning in the first decades of the 7th century BC, in which the will to create a coherent inhabited area on the two plateaus of Vignale and Civita Castellana is clearly perceivable from the archaeological record. Both the data from the necropolis and the settlement supports this interpretation and incidentally this is a picture that finds a close and compelling parallel in the recently proposed reconstruction of the urban development of Vey II. The centuries between the end of the 8th and the 6th century BC at Faleri can be therefore considered the moment in which the urban structure, from a physical point of view, becomes perceivable. And to this regard, it is relevant to bear in mind that a secondary urbanization, um, it's not um, my definition of this secondary urbanization, on the model of the, on the already existing Etruscan urban settlements, has been proposed for the Faliscan and Capenite areas. And it is now certainly appropriate to begin reassessing the archaeological data in order to understand what the components of this change are and what roles were played by them. It is self-evident that we will not be able to reach a clear, certain and univocal picture, but I think that the stronger trust and connections existing with the certain reality in premise can be a precious source of evidence, and I further think that it is not an over-interpretation to read in this perspective an economic interest of the coastal areas in the inner areas of the region, in particular the possibility of establishing connections with the potential exploitation of the Tiber Valley. In the Tiber Valley there's not only they, there's also someone peeping in from the coast, that is Cere. 
At the same time, the presence of metallic <coughs> elements in this scenario, such as that clearly present in the already mentioned Cappuccini tomb, further supports this view. In other words, I believe that we should read the urban development and, to a substantial extent, the urban organization of Faleri as a consequence of a convergence of maybe primarily economic interests in the area. And it's not the case that the urban form emerges at Faleri, and this, in a sense, creates the premises for the death of the other main Falistan settlement of Narche. There's not enough room for two cities there. If the 7th, 6th century is the moment in which we can detect what we could describe as different groups of, again, families, I don't want to use clan, uh, uh, gains. It's not my intention here. It's a tra it's Faliscan, a Etruscan, not Roman. Therefore, elite families organizing their private spaces on the two hills of Civita Castellana and Vignale. What happens next? After roughly a century of consolidation of the power of these families, what happens in the fifth? From the beginning of the 5th century BC, the urban form in its monumental aspect is fully apparent at Faleri as in most Etruscan cities. The works connected to the regularization consolidation of the urban perimeter, also through the city was the organization of a complex system of water supply on the two plateaus, the monumentalization of the sacred areas, and possibly also the organization of at least a part of an necropolis, are the major pieces of evidence for this process that has in part already happened and is in part still in progress. In other words, the presence of a complex system of public infrastructures clearly shows a distinct organization of the urban space too. So we do not know what kind of political structure ruled Faleri in that period. But it is clear that the enormous effort displayed in the organization of the urban layout, both in the urban and in the suburban areas, must be considered as the direct outcome of a clear centralized political choice. In this respect, the sacred areas of the city, with their extremely rich sets of architectural decorations, can be considered one of, if not the most, visible sources of information concerning this process, whose starting point can be set at the very beginning of the fifth. A suggestive an intriguing parallel can be therefore established between the moment in which Faleri appears in the ancient written sources and the one in which we can perceive the monumentalized city thanks to the archaeological data. If we wanted to find a plausible explanation for this contemporary manifestation, we could perhaps argue that the economic growth of the area from the mid 7th century BC was the premise that led to a growth in social and political complexity too. This situation, strengthened in the 6th, as clearly demonstrated on a private level, for instance, by the presence of extremely rich grave goods, formed especially of Attic imports, then gave birth in the 5th to an archaeological visible form of power also on a public level. The premises for the Roman interest intervention in the area, as testified in the written sources, could be therefore recognizing this progressive growth of importance of the area to be framed in the more general economic flourishing of the Tiber Valley. A good, if not the best example to demonstrate the way in which the political authority managed this process is the monumentalization of the public areas. Now I will tell a number that doesn't correspond, I know. Seven of the nine sacred areas known at Faleri, there are more, but uh, most of the numbers that you see correspond to one, two scattered terracotta decorations. Therefore, we cannot really have the certainty of a big sacred area. For me, uh, they are just, let's say, terracotta decorations. They are scattered and they, are, they testify the presence, maybe the presence of the sacred area. Nine are the ones on which we can reasonably think and uh, seriously think about them. So seven of the nine sacred areas known at Faleri show a phase that can be dated in the 5th century BC. Uh, look at the reddish one with that COE's construction and they are built for the first time, monumentalized for the first time. Uh, the Scasato II, the Fondo Belloni, the Via Gramsci, the Vignale, 
there's a reconstruction, a refurbishing, a reconstruction, we are not sure in Celle, Sassi Caduti, Ninferosa, we are all at the beginning of the fifth. Although we can ground our considerations on data that have different degrees of accuracy, it is possible to assert that the majority of the above-mentioned sacred areas were organized in their monumental form in the first decades of the fifth, as clearly shown by the analysis of the terracotta decorations. In other words, in those years, a deep formal change in the appearance of the cult places of the city took place. It is probably a moment in which the already existing religious traditions, on which we are unfortunately extremely badly informed, were reshaped. The architectural terracottas can provide a firmer chronology on a stylistic basis of part of the activities carried out on public buildings. In this respect, they have been widely investigated also in the recent years and clearly speak of a community that can afford to commission different kinds of decorative systems. In particular, that connected to the Vignale sacred area that cannot be dated before 490 was considered as the only original system created in the Faliscan seat in that period, while the others, the Agrancia and Sassicaduti examples, must be included among the composite system. It is a kind of um, Michelinie of already existing decorative systems. They are assembled, they were not uh, univocally created. It is evident that the commission of an original system speaks also of considerable economic means of the community. In other words, it is rather plausible to think that a difference existed between the assemblage of already used types and the creation of a new coherent system. This circulation of pieces among different sacred areas in a single city is a hint of the ways in which the public authority could dispose of a single pieces composing a public commission. And in this respect, the discovery at Faleri, in the sacred areas themselves, or in their vicinity, particularly in the Vignale locality, <coughs> of the molds used to produce the architectural decorations of the buildings pertaining to the centuries, is highly relevant. These artifacts are evidence, on the one hand, of local production. Although we are not presently informed if the productive structures were set in the vicinity or somewhere else in the city. And on the other hand, suggestive of a deliberate storage of the necessary tools to reproduce and reuse the already existing terracotta decorations. Furthermore, the chronology of these artifacts that you see in the slide, it goes from let's say, the beginning of the fifth down to the third century BC, found on the Vignale Hill, is evidence for the continuity of this kind of procedure that must be somehow connected to the continuity of management of urban sacred structures by a specific public authority. We do not have time here to tackle the issue in detail, but this kind of management of public resources could be detected also on a wider scale in Etruscan cities, for instance, in the Chere case, thanks to the study of the terracotta decorations of the sacred areas of the city and of the ones of the territory, Monte Tosto in Pirgi, for instance. Furthermore, a shared technical feature visible both in the monumentalization of the public areas and in the creation of the already mentioned wide urban infrastructures seems to be further evidence supporting the recognition of a general univocal plan underlying these interventions. All the monumental evidence I quoted was built at least at the foundation level with tufa blocks with no use of mortar according to the contemporary modus operandi in central Tyrrhenian Italy. In this respect, it seems to me that an apparently minor detail is instead particularly relevant for our purposes. The dimension of these blocks, well, all, both those used in the construction of the systems connected to the sacred areas on the Vignale Hill and the blocks that form the so-called city walls, they all share the same dimensions that are roughly 40, 40, 85 centimeters. Uh, this inevitably suggests at least a shared system of measurements adopted on a public level. But more in detail, it could be a further suggestion of a unitary planning carried out by the central administration of Faleri in the first decades of the 5th century BC. We do not have a clear picture of the ways in which this political power managed the construction of these monuments, but it is rather self-evident but the existence of a well-organized system of quarries that could supply the city with an extremely high number of blocks necessary to carry out such an ambitious monumental plan must be presumed. 
And for these purposes, the few traces of, traces of quarries discovered in the Scazato area and the city center obviously cannot be enough to fulfill the needs of such a project. Instead, the connection of this wide reorganization of the public space to the large quarry discovered a few years ago in the immediate extra urban area of Valeri, you can see here the, the position, seems more convincing to me. The materials from the site support the above chronology in which the quarry was in use between, let's say, the 5th and the 3rd century BC. And analysis of the cutting planes demonstrates that blocks of the dimension used to build the previously described urban structures were carved there. Furthermore, the position of the quarry is particularly convenient to fulfill the needs of the city. Being in the immediate extra-urban area, outside the ring formed by the necropolis, but at the same time not too far from the city and with easy access to the western urban area. The transport of the building materials would have therefore been simple and not exceedingly expensive. The will for reorganization under a political pressure described, described above can be recognized, although in a less explicit way, in the necropolis too. In the 5th century BC, no new necropolis can be recognized. What is extremely relevant for our purposes, the chamber tombs are organized on regular terraces obtained in the Tufa Cliff. The entrances of the tombs seem to be neatly and univocally oriented following the orientation of the cliff. Such an organization could be clearly recognized, for instance, in the Celle, Colonnette, and Penna necropolis you see from the old plan of the 19th century, and in part in Valsia Rosa too. Uh, and although obviously different from the idea of an orthogonal plan, such as the ones known in the case of Vossini or Via degli Infri e Cere, I wonder whether it would not be the case to recognize a clear public intervention in such an evident planned organization, with all the socio-political consequences this implies. Uh, it is, in other words, another clear testimony of the ways in which the political authority managed the space of the city in an interesting combination public-private in this case. Now, uh, I believe that, that these few examples testify the possibility to investigate a trust and urbanism under a new light through the detailed investigation of the micro-scale level. As said at the beginning of this lecture, I would like to spend a very, promise, very few words on the future of the research plan. The first and almost obvious observation is that uh, I am no more enough. In other words, uh, if we think that this approach can be considered a fruitful one, the next step is to apply it to the whole plot of self trust and cities. They, Cher, Tarquini and Volci in primis. And this is the direction in which I would like to move. Uh, it is all a question of resources now, human in premise, and then economic, obviously. Uh, but I do think that a research carried out in this way would be a turning point in the knowledge of a trust and urbanism.